Hello and welcome to this online event on COVID-19 and the labor market, impacts, reactions, and policy challenges. This is an event organized by LIAMEP, the Hellenic Foundation for European and Foreign Policy, in collaboration with FAFO, the Institute for Labor and Social Research in Norway. This online discussion takes place in the context of a project, a research project that LIAMEP is implementing together with FAFO on youth employment and gender equality, mobilizing human capital for sustainable growth in Greece. And this uh, project, as well as this uh, event today, uh, is kindly supported by the EA grants. Uh, I think this is a, the theme of our discussion today is a very topical issue of great concern to all workers and businesses everywhere. Uh, and I think it becomes particularly topical as we gradually transition back to normality uh, as the pandemic dissipates and vaccination rates increase. Given the focus of our research projects, uh, the focus also of the discussion is going to be uh, more about Greece and, and Norway and the Nordic countries, their experience. But of course, unavoidably, many of the challenges we're going to talk about today uh, you know, affect and are common to many countries uh, that have uh, been affected by the pandemic across the world. We have a very interesting and diverse panel today with us. We have a member of the big parliament, as well as esteemed experts and policy makers from Greece and Norway. Um, the, outline, the outline of the event is as follows. Um, uh, Christine Alsos, who is the research director of uh, FAFO, and Daphne Nikolitsas, scientific advisor to William Ebb and assistant professor at the University of Crete are going to present some empirical findings uh, on the impact of the COVID uh, in Greece and the Nordic countries with an emphasis on Norway um, and some of the challenges that have uh, arisen uh, because of the pandemic. And then we have uh, our three esteemed commentators, uh, Mr. Michael Argyru, Chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, the Hellenic Ministry of Finance, Roger Bjornstad, Chief Economist of the Norwegian Confederation of Trade Unions, and Marilisa Xenayanakopoulou, Member of Parliament uh, at Syriza, a major opposition party and responsible of the party for labor market and labor relations, who will be commenting on these presentations and of course offering their views uh, on the issues covered. Before all that, uh, we are very honored also to have with us Mr. Stein Gendem, Deputy Head of Mission at the Royal uh, Norwegian Embassy in Greece, who will be offering some opening remarks. Uh, one final note for me, uh, for all of, all of those of you watching this event, uh, you can address your questions and comments at the following email, events at liamep.gr, or you can leave your comments and questions on our Facebook and YouTube accounts uh, where this event is being broadcasted live. So um, I don't want to waste any more time. Um, uh, Mr. Stein Gendem, Deputy Head of Mission, the Royal Norwegian Members in Greece, the floor is yours. Thank you. Kalispera uh, sas, or good dog, as we say in uh, Norwegian. I'm uh, delighted to join you today. It's a true pleasure to, to be with you, representing the donor countries of the EEA grants, Norway, Iceland and uh, Liechtenstein. Unfortunately, we're, uh, we're not able to meet in person, but uh, during the last year, we've uh, learned that online conferences can, uh, can be good alternatives. And one upside to, to meeting online is that we can see each other's faces without masks. For, uh, for those of you who are uh, not familiar with the EEA funding mechanism, uh, a few words of introduction. The EEA grants represent the contribution of uh, Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein to reducing economic disparities and strengthening social cohesion in uh, 15 countries in Central and Eastern Europe. And Greece has been a beneficiary country of the EEA grants since the early days uh, of the mechanism back in uh, 1994 and has received in total 180 million euros in financial support. The project uh, we're discussing today, Youth uh, Employment and Gender Equality, is financed via the EEA Grants uh, Bilateral Fund, which is a special funding tool that aims to strengthen bilateral relations between the donor countries and the beneficiary countries. 
And we're uh, particularly excited about uh, this project as it deals with a very important issue, but also because it brings together two renowned research institutions from Greece and Norway, Eliamep and Fafo Institute for Labor and Social Research. The pandemic has posed new challenges for the labor market across the world. Uh, we have seen loss of jobs in key sectors in, um, in the key sectors of many countries. And uh, too many young people, not only in Greece, as you mentioned, Dimitris, uh, are becoming detached from education and the labor market, which can damage uh, their long-term prospects, as well as ultimately uh, undermine the social and economic development of their societies. I'm uh, looking forward both to hearing your analysis of the current conditions of the Greek labor market and uh, what policy proposals you have to increase access to the labor market uh, and how to reduce gender barriers. The cooperation between Eliamep and FAFO is an excellent opportunity to share knowledge, experience and good practices from Norway and Nordic countries. And though the, the context in Greece is different from the Nordic countries, I'm uh, sure we can benefit from the exchange of knowledge. We're looking forward to the announcement and presentations of the full project results this fall. So on behalf of the donors, thanks to everyone for joining this event, and I look forward to the discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jandem. Um, uh, I will uh, right away give the floor to Christine to present us um, her findings on Nordic countries and uh, Norway. Thank you very much. I will... Uh share my screen now. Uh, I hope, hope you can see the presentation all right. Uh, so thank you for the invitation to discuss the labor market impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I will base my presentation partly on the work we have done at FAFA together with colleagues in other Nordic countries in a project on the future work. And uh, in the work we've done the last few years, we have looked into opportunities and challenges for the Nordic labor market models in the coming 50 to 20 years. And based on this, we have identified four possible risks for the Nordic labor markets. However, the empirical work in this project was undertaken before the COVID-19 pandemic. So what I plan to do now is to discuss the, the, these risks one by one and then comment on how each of them could be affected by the ongoing economic crisis. So then I start out with um, the risk of lack of labor or shortages of labor. And uh, the fast aging populations in the Nordics will lead to stagnation in working age populations, especially in Finland and Denmark. And as you can see to the left here from the Norwegian example, this is a uh, a totally new situation for the Norwegian labor market, following a long period of growth in the working age population. And along with further urbanization, this will bring more shortages of labor and skills, making it crucial to increase domestic mobility to match labor and jobs throughout the country. And furthermore, due to even lower birth rates in Eastern and Central Europe, the cross-border competition to attract migrant labor will be fiercer. In parallel, Pressures for third country immigration will persist, probably making immigration and integration policies even more contested in the years to come. So a critical factor for the Nordic countries will thus be to mobilize sufficient supply of labor and qualifications and making inclusion, skill formation, and facilitation of belonging careers and working time among women, especially, and ethnic minorities, a key issue. The COVID-19 pandemic can be ex expected to have only minor effects on the, to this risk. Difficulties in keeping the pandemic outside nursing homes, especially in some of the Nordic countries, can lead to a high demand for full-time skilled employees in the health and care sector, where part-time shares among women are high. How it will affect global migration is harder to foresee. The pandemic could worsen the situation in some countries, and be a driver for higher mobility in the first phase, but in the first phase be restricted by uh, tight border controls. The second risk we identified is the lack of job risk. 
This is linked to the wave of digital and technological change that is supposed to have the most disruptive and transformative impact on employment and the ways we work. The fear of technological unemployment is old. Some says that it is, was already discussed as the wheel was invented. But so far, the fear has not come true. As you can see, employment has increased in the Nordics since the ICT revolution in the 1990s. And we do not find any signs of jobless growth in the last decades. Looking at the manufacturing industry alone, one would believe that the end of work is close in the Nordics. However, the reason for why we haven't seen any decrease in the number of jobs is that the decrease in manufacturing employment has been more than compensated with the growth in services. Nowadays, four out of five Nordic jobs can be found in the service sector. Whether this will continue is an open question. But we argue that this is rather a political than a technological question. To continue the growth in the service sector, the price growth of services must not exceed the growth in income of those who are going to pay for these services. If so, the demand will drop. So, so far in the Nordic countries, this has been sold through taxation by redistribution of income and by subsidizing both welfare services. And so far, the Nordics have not, or at least not, in the same extent as in Germany, accepted the establishment of a low-wage sector to increase the demand of services. But if the strategy of redistribution and tax finance public services are left behind, a low-wage sector, low sector might be the path of the future. And this will typically affect jobs uh, for young people, for women, and for immigrants. What really makes a difference when it comes to employment in the short term is at the economic crisis as the one we're facing at the moment. So looking at the red circles here, you will see that following the economic crisis in Sweden and Finland in the 1990s, it took a decade before employment rates hit pre-crisis level and similar developments followed the financial crisis in Denmark and Finland in 2008 and 9. So what can we expect following the ongoing economic crisis. The economy seems to recover quickly when societies open up, indicating that this crisis comes with a stronger V-curve than previous crises. However, jobs in the service sector have been lost and some of them will not return, especially in transport, hotels and restaurants. And econ economists often stress the difference between manufacturing and services and that is considerably harder and more resource demanding to create new manufacturing jobs compared to, compared to service jobs. But at the same time, it's easy to forget that it matters what the recreation of service jobs will look like. There is a risk that, the, that multinational companies like Amazon, uh, Starbucks and similar companies will be the one to replace some of the service, service jobs that are lost during the pandemic. And this will affect both wages and working conditions in the sector, collective bargaining, and not the least, the tax revenues of the Nordic countries. Then turning to the third risk, changing labor market structures and growing skill gaps. The question is what kind of jobs that will disappear in the future due to technological development and digitalization. And if the workforce has the skill needed to match with the new jobs created. There are two theories addressing this. One is called polarization, uh, where the jobs in the middle disappear, but you will have a growth of jobs in the uh, low skill end and high skill end of the, of the labor market. And the other is upgrading, where the share of low skill job will be reduced and more jobs are created in the higher end of the wage and skill structure. So what this figure tries to, to, to show you is that so far in the Nordics, we have seen a more or less an upgrading of jobs. Uh, the share of jobs with low wages and low skills in the figure indicated by the first and second quintiles are on decline, Denmark accepted here. But, uh, and this indicates that the social partners and the governments are facing an important task in making sure that the labor force are able to adjust to new skill requirements and increase mobility across sectors. Furthermore, this also indicates that the competition for entry jobs will be tougher and making it harder for young people and immigrants to get a foothold in the labor market. 
This might lead to lower employment rates and more people depending on welfare benefits. The upgrading has been stronger for women than for men in this period due to jobs in male-dominated in industries having been on the decline. And we can already see the decreasing employment rates among men in both Denmark and Norway. This restructuring process can be expected to have gained speed during the last year, affecting low-skilled groups in retail, hotel and restaurants. But at the same time, due to low investment rates, it might have slowed down the digitalization of other industries like manufacturing. Lastly, there is a risk of a more divided working life. Uh, and whether we have called it here the four-fifth uh, working life, or you could call it the two-third, that's not really important. But the question is whether we move into, the, into a direction where most of us gain from productivity growth and a generous welfare state, while a share of the population end up in lasting uh, in work poverty. Uh, Guy Standing wrote about the precariat a few years ago, and the class below the working class population, a class of freelancers and other atypical workers dealing with a very fragmented working life. In the Nordics, we have not seen the same development. The share of non standard work is about the same in all countries and is not increasing. However, these aggregated numbers might disclose industry or company variation. Findings suggest that something is going on in the low wage end of the labor market, and this could be illustrated in different ways. Uh, to the left here, you can see how the income difference between those with the highest wages, D90, and those with the lowest wages, D10, uh, has have developed over years. As you can see, especially in Norway, uh, in the purple line there, the high wage earners have increased their income considerably more than those in the lower end. In the year 2000, they earned twice as much as those in D10, while in 2018, it was increased to 2.5. And to the right, you can see the share of low-wage earners, those earning two-thirds or, or less of median hourly wage, and it's growing in all the Nordic countries except Finland. And one of the main explanations of these figures are uh, related those, uh, that those uh, on the outside of the collective bargaining system are not able to keep pace with the wage development in the rest of the labor market. A special concern in the longer term perspective of the COVID-19 is that young people risk once more being the big losers of the crisis as several hard hit branches offer fewer entry jobs. Youth employment in Sweden was above the 2008 and 9 level in June 2020. And in December, both Finland and Sweden had close to one out of four below the age of 25 out of work. And looking at the latest number, uh, the, the share is uh, more or less the same. And this is worrying uh, as the scaring effects of entrant cohorts documented after earlier crises tend to persist throughout their working career. So, in other words, the COVID-19 crisis might accelerate the, the development towards a more divided society as the loss and gains of the crisis are in, inequality, in, inequally dist distributed. While lockdowns have led to job loss in low-wage industries, standard workers and typical hard-skilled office, job office jobs have been less affected, but instead increased their savings. In this way, the pandemic has addressed, added both to existing income and wealth inequalities. And furthermore, new fragile labor relations seems to pop up under an after crisis. Denmark and Finland saw a marked increase in short term and non standard work during their period of sluggish growth after the financial crisis. And similar high contemporary work uh, was seen after the, the severe Swedish crisis of the 1990s, while platform work took off in in UK and US during the financial crisis. So besides repressed job growth and higher unemployment, uh, which raised the hurdles for inclusion of vulnerable groups, there is clearly a risk of increasing non-standard work and further fragmentation of low-skilled, low-paid jobs in the wake of the pandemic. Summing up, there are several challenges ahead for the Nordic countries and their labor markets. And many of these challenges can be accepted to have been worse following the ongoing economic crisis. And whether the Nordic labor market models will be able to provide low levels of inequality and high levels of employment in the future is a political question, and not only a national, but an international political question. 
as both the green transition and taxing of multinational companies, to mention some, require cooperation across borders. So I'll stop there and I look forward to hearing your comments and to the debate afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Thank you very much for a very concise and interesting um, presentation, including major challenges for the future. Um, you are thinking ahead, of, if, I think, if, if a few more years than we do here in Greece uh, in terms of challenges. But we're starting, I think, to gradually correcting uh, that. Uh, I'd like now to, um, to move uh, to, to, to Daphne, Daphne Nikolitsa. Please, Daphne, if you're ready, you, you may take the, the floor. Okay, so good afternoon. Um, I hope you can hear me and I hope you can see my slides. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to take part in this panel, which uh, seems very exciting. And I'm looking forward to the discussion that will take place. The work I'm going to be presenting to you is joined with uh, Kiriakos Bilinis, who is also working on this project. My focus, uh, compared to what Christine uh, told us uh, previously, Youth rather than uh, the labor market as a whole. So let me get going. So where, where did we start from? What the, did the labor market look like during the crisis? And what uh, do we expect the long-term challenges to be? This is what I would like to talk to you about. Now, um, what do youth in Greece do? Youth in Greece are different to youth in Norway. What does a typical 22-year-old person do in Greece? A typical 22-year-old woman has a 40% chance of being employed, a 40% chance of being in education, a 10% chance of being unemployed, and a 10% chance of being inactive. A 22-year-old man has a 40% chance of being employed, a 40% chance of being in education, a 15% chance of being unemployed, and a 5% chance of being inactive. Now, um, now I'm at the age of 22, the two genders seem quite symmetrical. When we move on to the age of 30, though, things change. Um, a 30-year-old 30, 30 woman has a 60% chance of being employed, whereas a 30-year-old man has an 80% chance of being employed. A 30-year-old woman has a 25% chance of being unemployed. A 30-year-old man has a 20% chance of being unemployed. A 30-year-old woman has a 5% chance of being in, in education, sorry. A 30-year-old man is likely not to be in education. So um, this is what it looks like. Uh, what is the comparative perspective? If we look at participation rates and employment rates in 2019, Greece uh, looks uh, worse than the rest of OECD Europe and Norway in particular. So, um, and Greece looks worse uh, the, more, the younger the individuals we are talking about. So things seem pretty bad. Uh, for the age group 20 to 24. And this is uh, not only for participation rates, but especially so for employment rates. Participation rates increase after the age of 24 and do not differ significantly from those in Norway. But employment rates are much lower in Greece than they are in OECD Europe or Norway. Now, I would like to uh, just take a couple of seconds to tell you what women who are not in the labor market and are not in education do. And this um, breakdown is the only one available. And what we find is that women who are not in education and not in the labor market are inactive because of family reasons. For Either they are either taking care of their children or dependents, or for other family or personal reasons, they are not in the labor market. Now, um, so much about stocks. What do flows look like? 
we know that mobility in the Greek labor market is much lower than it is in other European countries or in other Scandinavian countries more particularly. And here um, I present a graph from the OECD uh, PX study, who, uh, which looks at how young gradual graduates are settling in the labor market and how many number of firms these individuals have worked for in the past five years. We see that uh, mobility in Norway is quite high. So uh, individuals between 25 and 34 years old have changed three jobs, whereas uh, individuals in Greece are much less mobile. They have spent, they have gone to two firms. Which sectors do Greek youth work for? It's mostly wholesale and retail and accommodation food service activity. So that is to, to say they are mostly employed in sectors in low skill sectors. And here the comparison in this graph is with individuals that are 35 to 59 year old, whether they are men or women. Now, I just, <laughs> I, I thought we might uh, have some numbers about uh, COVID statistics and I looked at the the cases are 178.8 million worldwide. Uh, the cases in Greece are around 420,000 and uh, the deaths are around 12,500 in Greece. Uh, we are moving on where we um, are. We're having some trouble with the sound, I think. Daphne, we cannot hear you. Okay. okay, sorry about that. We're having some trouble uh, getting through to Daphne. Uh, some problem with the connection. I am sure she will be back with us shortly. Um, uh, but before that, I mean, I think perhaps we can start with our commentators because um, uh, already Christine in her own presentation uh, put on the table uh, a number of very interesting uh, challenges uh, that are relevant not only for the Nordic countries in Norway, but also for Greece. Um, and, and I'd like to hear some of uh, our commentators' um, uh, comments on that. For example, yesterday, uh, to make just one point, on the shortage of labor that Christine mentioned, there was a, a, an article in the Financial Times about Greece facing um, uh, labor shortages in its um, efforts to recover, particularly in sectors like tourism, food and beverage, and so on. Um, and there were a number of reasons given by those interviewed to, to do the article, like uncertainty, perverse incentives in terms of the continued subsidies or too much supply in those sectors, for example. Uh, that is, too many bars and restaurants in Greece competing for uh, a limited um, labor supply. Um, uh, so, uh, with that point, I would like to start with um, our member of parliament, Marilisa Xenogenakopoulou from Syriza. Um, uh, Ms. Xenogenakopoulou would like to, to hear your comments. You have the floor. Hello to everybody. Thank you very much for your invitation. I'm delighted also to participate in this very interesting discussion. Uh, as you well said uh, at the beginning, it's a very topical issue and uh, uh, I found really interesting the presentation by Mrs. Alsus uh, and the, 
presentation we had the chance to, uh, until now to see from Mrs. Nikolica, I'm sure will, uh, she will follow when uh, the technical problem is solved. I would like to make some uh, general remarks. Uh, first of all, uh, I see Mrs. Nikolica has... Uh, Came back, there is a park. Maybe you would like to complete your presentation. <laughs> yes, uh, if, if you don't mind since no, you no, haven't no started problem. yet. No problem. We better so that you comment on both of the presentations. So Daphne, if you can please. Apologies, uh, apologies about this. Um, okay. Okay, I'll try and be as fast as possible. So uh, basically unemployment, the unemployment rate didn't change. What changed uh, substantially was the hours worked. So there is an 11.5% decline in hours worked. Now, if we look at what happened in different sectors of economic activity, we see that in most sectors, but especially trade and hospitality and other service activities, there is a huge uh, decrease in value added, whereas employment, that, that is actual numbers of individuals employed, didn't change by much. There are some sectors, though, like manufacturing, for example, where the decline in output and employment were of equal size. Now, uh, the government took a number of employment support measures to mitigate the impact of the pandemic. And a lot of firms made use of these. Uh, there was uh, support for workers whose contracts had been suspended. There was a short-time working scheme and there was an employment subsidy program. And these are the main direct measures for the labor market. There were other indirect measures to make sure that companies can survive this pandemic, such as the repayable advance payments to enterprises, mandatory rent reductions in business properties or the suspension of tax and social security obligations. Now what changed during the pandemic was the participation rates. Participation rates decreased somewhat, especially between the ages of 25 to 29. And um, if we look at employment rates, there is a decrease in employment rates of those aged between 25 and 29, and especially so men. Working from home increased, but this was mostly for age groups that were higher than youth, so above the age of 34, as was expected as these individuals, older individuals, are working in jobs where teleworking was more feasible. One of the changes, that, and I think this goes in contrast to what uh, we were told by Christine about Norway, was that education or the participation in education increased. So individuals who didn't join the labor market continued their studies or decided to study. Now, uh, let me uh, just add a few words on business expectations for the future and um, challenges going forward. Pandemics do differ from other crises. And they differ in several respects, and it depends which cri what kind of crisis we are comparing them to. But what is important is to look at how labor and how capital are affected by a pandemic. In the case of a pandemic where capital is not destroyed, then um, it is likely that investments will not increase massively uh, after that. So. The chance that the labor market will recover uh, just due to investment because of uh, destruction in capital is not likely to take place. European businesses uh, seem to be um, hesitant about uh, going forward, about uh, doing more investment, as they don't know what the length of the crisis will be and what the picture will be post-crisis. What about Greek businesses? Businesses' expectations are rather um, bleak, and uh, this is mostly so for small and very small enterprises. When asked in February this year, uh, one in four uh, small and very small businesses expressed um, fear that they would not be able to survive, whereas around 70% of businesses expressed a view that the pandemic, or the economic crisis resulting from the pandemic, Will, uh, will last for another, or oh, in total for two years. Now, um, what are some longer term concerns for the Greek labor market? 
the low productivity, uh, the demographics, which as uh, in Norway look rather um, pessimistic. As we can see, the age group six, 65 and over is increasing. Um, and these are not uh, forecasts, yeah, they are just um, historical figures. Uh, whereas the uh, groups 0 to 14 and 15 to 34 are decreasing. Oops. Uh, I'd like to mention two more points. There are geographical disparities in Greece in the labor market, which are big. And I think not enough importance is given to them. We tend to look at what happens in big cities and not what happens in uh, areas outside Athens and Salonika. And the final point I'd like to mention is that there are inequalities in opportunities and income, such as those mentioned uh, for Norway, uh, which are likely to become worse going forward. Okay. Thank you very much, and apologies for the interruption. Thank you, Daphne. Problem? I mean, I think we all have learned in these webinars that uh, this sort of thing is, is quite common. Uh, we were able to overcome it quickly. So I would like to go back to Ms. Xenogianakopoulou, RMP, we, who I, I uh, very kindly <laughs> gave her position for Daphne to complete. So, Back to you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I consider both presentations very interesting. And I would like to make uh, several general remarks. First of all, I think we all agree uh, that the pandemic crisis has revealed the limits and the deficits of uh, the mainstream austerity and restrictive economic policy. Uh, I think also that we all agree that we have very important uh, economic and social issues to face and it is really an optimistic step on behalf of the European Union that we have seen a turn of policy. Uh, we have seen the abandoning of uh, the last 10 years austerity approach uh, that had prevailed. We see now that there is a turn on uh, the need to support uh, the real economy, to support SMEs and uh, the labor market, to support wages. It's very interesting that the European Parliament is now considering a directive regarding the increase uh, and uh, a minimum, in quotes, European minimum wage. Uh, also, of course, uh, the suspension of the Stability Pact, the measures taken by the European Central Bank, in order to reinforce uh, the recovery of the economy all over Europe. And of course, uh, uh, most of all, the recovery fund, which of course is the major step ahead for the European Union. Uh, having said that, uh, the second remark is, and the question I think for all of us, uh, what will be the day after of the pandemic crisis? Are we going back to business as usual with uh, the certain a political and economic approach we had followed the last 10 years and with all the major economic and social uh, problems we have seen. Uh, of course, our Norwegian friends are full aware of all uh, the economic policies with the memorandum of understanding that Greece uh, had uh, in the last years and all the results we had uh, on social and economic uh, impact. And I believe that the, what is important now is to have permanent change regarding our policies. And it's quite interesting to see the example coming from the other side of the Atlantic, uh, following what President Biden is uh, now raising regarding the need for taxation, the taxation of the multinationals, uh, raising the issue that uh, we need to support trade unions, the middle uh, classes, uh, small and medium enterprises, and of course, the wages and the employees. I feel this is the way ahead. Uh, I think this is gaining ground. And uh, we have to consider, and it has been said in the presentations, and especially by Mrs. Alsus, that the pandemic crisis has accelerated 
the digitalization of uh, economy, of uh, far away distance work, and uh, the need to see how we approach all these major changes and the new divisions that we'll see in uh, the labor market and in our society, and how can we uh, achieve social cohesion? How can we achieve that these changes do not bring major and more divisions in our societies and with a direct impact, of course, to the uh, economy as such, and also in the necessary transformation in uh, a fair uh, transformation to a green economy. So I come to my third remark. And uh, I must say that uh, I'm afraid that the policies chosen by the Greek government during the pandemic crisis and uh, regarding the labor market are in quite the uh, contrary uh, direction from what we see as the major change at European and American policies regarding the uh, economy, the support of the SMEs and the uh, labor market. Uh, recently, only last week, uh, the government has passed a new labor bill in uh, the Greek parliament, which uh, has two main goals, uh, the deregulation of the labor market and uh, uh, having uh, you know, an effect, a negative effect on the wages of the employees. In uh, reality, it's, uh, the regulation is going to have a very big impact uh, in salaries. It increases uh, cheap labor hours, and it's going to have a very negative impact also on uh, the unemployed. Uh, at a time when we see that uh, unemployment is increasing, and as well Mrs. Nikolica has stated, there were measures in support of uh, uh, suspension of uh, labor contracts, but now that the economy is restarting, uh, the fear is that we're going to see a very big increase of unemployment. So I strongly believe, and uh, I think that is uh, the answer to the big challenges we are facing, that the answer cannot be more deregulation, cheaper uh, work, and uh, having salaries uh, with, which cannot provide uh, a, a, a way of, uh, for the employees uh, a decent way of living. I think this is a recipe that uh, has failed. Uh, there is a need to change policy and I would be very much interested to have uh, certain comments on these issues from our uh, Mrs. Alsos and Mrs. Nikolic and, of course, all the other participants. And uh, I would like to say that even the uh, European Commission Directive on Minimum Wages uh, has clearly stated that uh, the idea of uh, having low salaries in not any way does it support uh, the fight against unemployment. We need to invest uh, in uh, new and quality jobs, and we need to invest in investments of quality of new technologies and also of a strong social state that can support and uh, give uh, prosperity and uh, a joint future without division to the whole of uh, our society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Kopoulou, for some very interesting points. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we're going to have the uh, opportunity to discuss some of them later on as, as well. Um, I'd like now to give the floor to Mr. Argiru, Chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors of the Hellenic Ministry of Finance, as it's usually called, the, the government's think tank, economic think tank. Uh, you have the floor, Mr. Argyrou. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And it is a real pleasure and an honor, I would say, to be among this very distinguished group, and I would like to thank the two presenters for their very interesting presentations. Yes, of course, uh, both presentations have touched upon a very rich agenda, so difficult to summarize in a few minutes uh, the diverse uh, uh, issues that have been raised. Uh, I have followed with great interest uh, the presentation by 
Christine, and uh, I would like to start by her conclusion. Uh, it is, uh, of course, very worrying that prospects in Nordic markets, Nordic labor markets, uh, raise the prospect of duality in the labor market and increasing vulnerability among groups of the population, uh, including women, the young, and uh, immigrants. Um, now, uh, I fully understand this uh, concern because these are problems that in uh, many South European labor markets, including Greece, we have. So, to a large extent, what is a threatening prospect in uh, Nordic labor markets is a depressing reality for many years in many European South markets. And uh, in the case of Greece in particular, the futures that you have described have been there for many years, even before the financial crisis. Greece is a country whose results in the labor market have been quite disappointing, even in the good times. Greece has had traditionally a very high unemployment rate, particularly among the women and the young. Of course, this got worse during the financial crisis, but it was there in advance. Uh, it has a high degree, a high proportion of people that are uh, at the risk of social exclusion and poverty, again, particularly among the women and the young. And this is not a new phenomenon, it was there. Furthermore, for too many years, uh, employment among the youth in Greece tends to concentrate, as Daphne said, uh, in low value added, relatively low value added sectors, which implies low productivity growth. And without productivity growth, it is not possible, besides political wishes, in the real life, in order to pay high wages, you need to have high productivity. And because we have not had high productivity, the wages, particularly among the women and the youth, has been very low. And uh, of course, there are significant problems in the labor market increase, including skills mismatching. Employers are asking for high skills, which are not there. And there is a significant degree of informality with a lot of people working undeclared or partly declared. Uh, as a result of which, of course, we have problems in relation to uh, collecting social insurance contributions, which has repercussions for the sustainability of the pension system. All these things have been there for many years. And clearly, with such kind of equilibrium outcomes, we cannot go on the way we do. And that is precisely the reason as to why the new labor law, but other initiatives to which I will briefly mention, has been introduced. It has been introduced, it includes best practices, it includes clauses, initiatives, and measures that have been uh, implemented with significant success elsewhere. And I can give you many examples. I can start, for example, from Ireland in the 1980s, move on to countries like Germany in the 1990s and Central European countries, moving on to uh, South European countries in more recent years. So what is in the new labor law is something that has been tested, has worked, has been successful, it uh, basically promotes the prospects of young people, women, and vulnerable groups to get a strong foothold in the labor market. It increases significantly the balance between professional and personal life. It also gives to uh, workers the right balance. It creates the conditions for the right balance between security on one hand and flexibility in the labor market on the other, which is uh, necessary in order to have a relocation of resources from low value added sectors to higher value added sectors. So we have high confidence that it will be a successful law as it has been elsewhere. And uh, I hope that in a future um, event, we will be able to evaluate it and uh, see its results. Now, uh, this is not enough. Having a good labor law on its own is not enough in order to have higher welfare for society and particular for women and the youth. You also need a strong safety net, which includes quality social services, including, for example, good schools, uh, good child care infrastructure, good long-term infrastructure, 
These are areas which have been neglected for too long and uh, the present administration invests significantly in them, as you can see from the various projects that have been included in the Recovery and the Resilience Fund. You need also good education. This is the passport to a large extent for social mobility in all modern societies. And when I say education, I also speak about vocational education, general education, university education. If you have a look at the statistics of Greece in recent years, they don't look very good. That is why the government taking a holistic approach has introduced a new education law, a new vocational law, and a significant number of initiatives in the context of the Recovery and the Resilience Fund. You also need a dynamic, rich job creating business sector. You cannot achieve this having policies that tax everything always high. You need also a good public service. You need, of course, uh, to upgrade the skills of people who will need to move from one job to another. That is, to some extent, unavoidable. So the answer, the long-term answer, is not to try to keep things in a state of inertia if this is not consistent with changing consumer patterns, but to give people through quality uh, upskilling and reskilling programs the opportunity to work elsewhere. And again, the Recovery and Resilience Fund includes what I would call a revolution in upskilling and reskilling in Greece. And of course, you need a good business, in, in, a good in business and investment environment which will create jobs. So the pandemic has been a major shock. Uh, Mrs. Xenayakopoulou said that it has uh, revealed the limits. I think that it would reveal the limits of everything. This kind of shock happens one every hundred years. So whatever is the government and whatever is uh, the political system, uh, you cannot deal easily with a shock that comes once every century. But I am glad to say that given the circumstances, Greece has uh, coped very well with the pandemic. The labor market has avoided the large increase in uh, unemployment. Of course, employment hours fell. Understandably, they fell because uh, they fell, and we saw this in uh, Daphne's uh, data, mostly in those sectors uh, that were, uh, that took the brand of the containment measures. So uh, it was a shock. Uh, the government reacted as recognized by uh, all international organizations, by markets, and uh, by all stakeholders, and above all, I believe, by Greek citizens, in a very timely, targeted, and effective manner. The unemployment rate has not increased. Poverty has not increased. It is a challenging period the way ahead. Nobody denies that. We should not be uh, painting a very rosy picture when we know that we are in the immediate aftermath of an unprecedented shock. But we do have a very good growth plan, which is underpinned by the growth plan that was uh, put together by Professor Pisaridis and his excellent team, a completely independent report uh, by economists uh, of complete political independence. So. We have that blueprint to which, to a large extent, we have trans transported into our RRF in Europe. I am optimistic that we will not have the typical post-crisis investment slump because of the recovery and resilience uh, facility, to which, of course, the Greek government and the Greek prime minister uh, took uh, great initiatives and are having a great contribution for its creation. So uh, this... Uh, recovery and Resilience Plan, the Recovery and Resilience Plan of the Greek government, which has been recently endorsed by the European Commission, involves very significant reforms and very significant investments. Greece has at its disposal the equivalent of approximately 20% of its GDP, the highest allocation among Eurozone countries and the third in the European Union, in order to transform its growth model towards a more sustainable, greener, more digital, more socially just, and more economically productive model. We are realistically optimistic that our plan will succeed. And we believe that among those who will have the greatest benefit of the forthcoming economic growth 
will be precisely those parts of the population that has so far been disadvantaged, including above and all the young and the women and also other vulnerable groups, without whom we have to say that the economy and the society cannot function the way we want it. So, um, as I said, a very rich agenda. Thank you very much for your um, very interesting presentations and I will be very glad to continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I think it is obvious that we have a, a disagreement on the, on the, on the contribution of, of the new law. Uh, I, mean, I think that's to be expected. Um, but moving on from that, we'll perhaps come back to that. Uh, I think the, the, the issue of the new labor law just, uh, I think, reveals the fact that for many countries like Greece, COVID has, um, has come at a time of, uh, in a transition period, if you like, uh, particularly countries like Greece coming out of a, a big previous crisis. Uh, so it has, uh, it poses an extra burden um, uh, to deal with challenges in, in a timely manner. Uh, and, 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 you know, the, the, the work done by our uh, friends in Norway, who seem to be looking a bit further afield uh, in the future, uh, may help us pinpoint some of the, the challenges next. So um, I'd like to turn to uh, Roger Bjornstad, Chief Economist of the Norwegian Confederation of Trade Unions, um, to, to hear his view on how, what has been said already. Uh, you have the floor, Roger. Thank you very much. Thank you also for inviting me to, to comment on this important seminar on the effects of COVID on the labor market. Going to the core explanation, trust and solidarity explains why the level of infection in Norway has been lower than in many other countries. Confidence in the authorities led to a high support for infection control among the population. The Norwegian social and economic model with good public welfare schemes, tripartite cooperation, and an organized working life has been a strength for Norway in the face of the pandemic. Through the tripartite cooperation, it has been possible to quickly get in place necessary crisis measures. And the cooperation has also contributed to the measures becoming more socially just than in the government's original purpose uh, for the measures. The welfare schemes contributed to people staying at home during illness and were actually quarantined on the suspicion of COVID infection. For example, the Norwegian sick pay scheme with a full pay from the first day of illness has contributed to sick employees not feeling pressured to go to work for reasons of their own finances. Furthermore, our system of a solid municipality a municipal health service with many permanent employees in uh, the service was what primarily protected the intensive care units from experiencing the conditions we saw in many other, many other countries. Most people who have died from corona were never sent to intensive care. However, in the municipalities, health personnel had to take care of them often without available infection control equipment. They worked double shifts, extremely much overtime, had their holidays revoked, and changed their working hours at very short notice. But still, employment fell sharply as a result of the pandemic in Norway too, as we have seen. Uh, the infection control measures that were implemented led to many companies being ordered to close or suddenly being without any customers. At most, in early April 2020, there were more than 400,000 employees registered as job seekers in Norway. And 290,000 of these were completely unemployed. The crisis hit hard, but there were still significant social imbalances also. The risk of dismissal or redundancy was clearly greater for employees with low income, short education, and low income family background. The analysis we have seen also shows that young people were hit harder than older people, 
immigrants harder than uh, Norwegian-borns, and uh, so on. So the crisis clearly shows the importance of a working life where the main rule is full and permanent positions. This in combination with the fact that elderly care mainly is organized in public sector help to keep the infection rates in Norway low. For example, now we, we have a proposal for free user choice in the municipal health service if that has been introduced before the pandemic, the situation could be very much different. The high death rates in Sweden, for example, is primarily associated with high mortality in the elderly care sector. The crisis also revealed that many sectors are vulnerable to closed borders. And this applies, among other sectors, to the shipbuilding industry in Norway, agriculture, the fishing industry, construction industry. In some of these sectors, it is also difficult to replace foreign workers with Norwegian vacant labor. The crisis has shown the intensive use of social dumping prior to the crisis, and that the businesses in Norway had been allowed to replace Norwegian-born workers with cheaper foreign workers instead of investing in technology, investing it in education, or training them themselves. Financially, the pandemic and infection control measures have primarily affected the private sector. In cooperation with, among others, ourselves and the Confederation of Employers, the government has adopted comprehensive support schemes to compensate for the loss of income, and economic policy has thus led to a redistribution of losses from the private to the public sector. But there is still a great inequality within the private sector, where some may have benefited financially, while others had not, has, uh, have not been able to cover the losses at all. Crisis tend to be socially biased, and the COVID-19 pandemic is no exception. There has been more infections in the eastern part of Oslo than in the western ones, for example. And some occupational groups, such as drivers and waiters, have been more exposed to infection than others. Both language, culture, living conditions have probably had an impact on the infections among the immigrant population. The polarized working life and inequality in health may indicate that people with low income have both had a greater risk of infection and serious illness from the pandemic. So not only has the pandemic affected socially uh, unfair, but also the infection control measures and some of the uh, compensating economic measures have been unsocially actually. This should have uh, consequences for future policy. The pandemic has put a magnifying glass on existing inequalities in our society, also in Norway. When society closed down, the home office nobility with spacious villas and access to cabins in the mountains in Norway had a more flexible everyday life where meetings could be taken digitally. While the families of, for example, five children in an apartment of 80 square meters had more demanding everyday life. Subsequently, the organization of some of the government's financial support measures reinforced these inequalities. The financial support packages to businesses, community were provided without conditions of, for a, uh, on a ban on dividends, for example, and without a ban on redundancies, and without a claim for repayment if the packages proved not to be necessary. Companies that have, been, have received large subsidies from the public sector have thus been able to make a profit and pay dividends to the owners at the same time as they have laid off their employees. So these are some of the uh, lessons that we have learned uh, throughout the crisis that um, trust 
must have been built up prior to the crisis. We had to have to protect our labor market from social dumping and uh, a low wage uh, policy. And we have to build a strong welfare sector and organize health services within the public sectors. And uh, there has been trends in the opposite direction that I will uh, hope uh, we uh, will concentrate on, on, um, on, on doing a better job in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roger. Uh... Uh, you gave us a very concise uh, um, picture of what happened in, in Norway and what worked and what not. Uh, and I think I will, I will uh, in trying to launch a new round of discussion, I'm going to pick up on your, your points, which I find very interesting, particularly for Greece, and also in this context of trying to, to learn for each other. I, I think we have more to learn from Norway than the other way around. Um, about the, the issue you uh, we pointed out, the, about the trust, social trust, solidarity, um, the tripartite cooperation, and so on. I think it's no, it is a no well-known fact that Nordic countries, no, not in particular, but more generally Nordic countries, are characterized by this type of uh, a high degree of social trust, um, societal peace and, and cooperation, if you like, and a sense of solidarity, a sense of solidarity, which... Uh, unfortunately, in countries of Southern Europe uh, and in Greece, above all, I would say, uh, perhaps Greece and Italy are times in this respect, uh, this is missing. Uh, we have a very polarized political and, and social system, uh, uh, including the social, uh, among the social partners. Trust is not there and uh, conflict is endemic, I would argue. Um, so... Um, I think this is a this is a very interesting issue, um, and this is uh, one question I'd like to pose to Mr. Yanagopoulou and Mr. Aryuru about how, how important the thing this is for for Greece to overcome some of these problems. Because as we saw also with the or, already with the comments and of course the discussion that preceded in in uh, previous days here in Greece, the new labor law, um, we, we have we tend to have this kind of. of, of dialogue of, of the deaf to, to some degree uh, for, for, for decades, perhaps. Don't seem to be able to, to reach a, a consensus of some sort. I would uh, agree with Ms. Knoyankopoulou that there is, seems to be a paradigm shift to some extent, of course, uh, coming from across the Atlantic, but also in Europe. And of course, Europe in this uh, time around has dealt very differently with the crisis than was the case the previous time. But I would also agree with Mr. Argyru that we need to um, structurally reform the Greek economy. It has huge, huge um, uh, problems. Um, uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, okay. My picture froze for a while. So there are huge structural problems in the Greek economy for a long, recognized for a long time. And by the way, Daphne there was part of the, uh, one of the writers of the Visarin report as well. Uh, and they pinpointed some of these um, uh, major structural weaknesses in the Greek economy. So I think we need to find a common, a, a common ground somewhere, uh, uh, a consensus of how to obviously not repeat the, 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 the same austerity kind of approach of the past, but uh, also do the necessary reforms. And if you like, this is my question for you in the second round. What type of reforms are needed and how can we hope to get this social trust, increase the, the, the level of trust and solidarity and, and, and uh, cooperation between the social partners. Um, for the speakers, also, I'd like to pose a few um, clarifying questions, if you don't mind. For, for Daphne, uh, you showed some, some numbers there showing that employment rates fell from men substantially uh, more than women, particularly in some age categories. And overall, it's a mixed picture. I, I think this goes against many of the findings internationally that say that women were mostly affected um, by the COVID, uh, were more affected than men by the COVID crisis. It's, I mean, is there something different in Greece happening? And if so, why is that? And also, I noticed a similar differentiation in education participation numbers. Uh, for men, it seemed to be, as you mentioned, on the rise, the percentages. But for women, I saw a decline there as well. 
Um, so again, why do, do we have an explanation for that? Why is this differentiation taking place? Uh, um, and also for, 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 for Christine's presentation, I would like to pose also um, a question regarding um, the labor shortage issue she mentioned, um, because she mentioned migration and we've seen that the Nordic countries have adopted a very differentiated way of handling the, the migration issue. Denmark, for example, uh, you know, ha has opted for a very different option, has received criticism from the European Commission as well for that. Um, so could you just uh, communicate to us uh, what's the public debate like on this issue uh, in, in the Nordic countries? Because this is also a big issue in Greece as well, uh, on different terms, of course, but uh, still very important. Um, and um, a question to everybody. Um, it was mentioned by the speakers in the presentations that there's a, a huge drop in working hours, but of course not in, but not in a corresponding increase in unemployment rates. And this is, of course, because of all these uh, support measures, short-time work schemes and uh, whatnot. Um, on the other hand, we, we see from uh, the ILO and ISA have put out reports that say that um, this has translated, uh, we don't see this rise in employment, not only because of the support schemes, but also because of a rise in inactivity rates. So many people simply do not bother to look for a job uh, anymore because they don't think perhaps they can find one during the pandemic conditions. Um, and this hits especially the young people, who, especially new entrants, for example, in the labor market. Um, uh, do you see this in the Nordic countries? Do we see this stuff in Greece? And what are the implications, especially for the young people, uh, uh, going forward? So um, this is just a, a, a bunch of questions try to, to, um, uh, to, to, to kick off a second round. And of course, you can react to everything else that has been said. Um, so if you uh, like, I would like to start again with our speakers to, to answer perhaps the clarification questions about the, the things we, we noticed in the numbers, and then again, we'll go back to our commentators. So if we can start the other way around, Daphne, perhaps you would like to start? Yes, sir, sure. Thanks very much for the comments. Uh, may, may I answer on a few points? So uh, what you mentioned about women being in a worse affected by the crisis, or the pandemic is true, uh, but what's happened is women are more burdened. They are more burdened with homework, they are more burdened with childcare, and they're more burdened with the work they are doing in the labor market. Whereas men um, just have to deal with the work that they're employed in. But what happens is women are employed in a far greater proportion in sectors that were not so much affected by the crisis, such as healthcare and education. And that explains why their employment rate did not decrease by as much. And the mirror image of that is the participation in education. Uh, because men were not uh, working, they went into education, whereas women, having been in jobs that were not destroyed to such an extent, or were not suspended to such an extent, did not join education. If I may say two uh, more things on uh, uh, trust and uh, the labor law, if I may. Uh, now, regarding the labor law, I think the discussion is, um, should focus rather on, uh, not on whether in a static way, the income of individuals increased by um, um, giving the opportunity for uh, the annualization of working hours. The in question to me is whether this increases the probability of survival of the businesses in which the employee is employed. And given that the annualization of working hours is followed by all firms in all countries that we are competing with, I think it would reduce the survival probability of Greek firms to not have the opportunity to, to use it. And just, uh, so I, I think when we are talking about changes that are taking place, we have to evaluate the starting point from which we are beginning and also what the international competition is doing. And then on trust and social trust, I think it's, um, 
it's a matter of uh, the fact that we in Greece are not so meritocratic. Allocation of talent is do not done on an objective basis. And I think um, the government's throughout history responsibility on this is great, both because they themselves are not meritocratic, but also because they do not take um, clear positions versus the social partners because they want to be on both sides all the time in order to gain votes. So from the, since the government is not taking a clear stance on matters, then social partners are not prepared to take the burden of decisions themselves. I think that's all I wanted to say at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daphne. Um, Christine, would you like to, to respond perhaps and comment also on what has been said? Yeah, thank you. And thank you for the, the, the kind and interesting uh, remarks that you all had. Uh, when it comes to the question of migration, I think uh, we're more similar to Denmark <laughs> than to, to Sweden when it comes to immigration policies. And I think this is twofold in a way, because you have the, the labor migration, mostly from, from EU member states and from Eastern Europe and uh, Eastern Central Europe. Uh, which is, uh, has been really important for the Norwegian economy. But on the same time, it has created um, discussion on, on, on whether, they, uh, whether they compete with, uh, with uh, the national workforce. Uh, and when you see that um, the, the employment rates among males are, is decreasing, you might ask whether they... They, there is kind of complete competition there where the, the cheaper uh, labor migrants uh, are, are winning. So that, that's, of course, an ongoing debate in Norway. But when it comes to more like refugees and, and immigrants from third countries, um, we have quite strict policies when it comes to this. And, uh, and for the labor market, the discussion is that uh, the participation rates are lower and, uh, and while many of them are in work at some time, uh, they often end their work career at an earlier stage than if you compare to those born in Norway. But at the same time, you, I mean, if you go to the next generation, uh, you will see that many of these are successful in the labor market. So in the longer term, immigration, of course, will be a good way to solve the, the labor shortages. And as we know, uh, where there is, uh, um, like in in, um, in in Africa, in the south of Sahara, there will be uh, a lot of uh, young people, working age people, uh, that will be ready also to, to go elsewhere to work. So whether we will have like a more third uh, country uh, labor Migration to Norway, I guess that also will be one of the big questions uh, coming up uh, in the next years. Yeah, so I think I'll stop there uh, for now. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. much. Uh, 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 Roger, Roger, would you like to like like speak about the negativity as well? And perhaps some, some of the trust, trust, trust is how do you, you get it? <laughs> Maybe it was my line in that was the problem, but I didn't hear you. Uh, but I thought I heard my name, so I'll just yes, yes, continue. Yes, I was saying something about the activity rate. Right. Right. Yes, I, I still can't hear you. It's very noisy, but. Um, Okay. If you can hear me, I can I can continue. Yeah, I want if if I can elaborate a little bit on that trust issue, um, because it's essential, I think. Um, and one thing we we know is that trust cannot be built during crisis. Trust must be built during the good times prior to the crisis, and we have to use the trust fighting crisis. So uh, that is certainly something, uh, something we have to, to learn on the other side of the pandemic, that we have to start building trust again. And it's uh, essential after decades with increasing inequalities and increasing dispersion in power 
for example, and we have um, uh, a solid evidence that uh, we have been uh, going in the opposite directions uh, for, for decades now. So fighting inequality, I think, is uh, a very important, uh, especially also because the pandemic has increased inequality and in increased the social uh, um, unfairness. And and, and, and and that is, of course, easier said than done, but I think we have to start thinking differently because if we demand that everybody should participate in, uh, in, in, uh, in income making, we also must distribute that income evenly. We cannot say that we demand that you participate in working life, but you will not get the benefit from this. So, um, and, um, and, and, and we must cover the whole society, both those who uh, can work and those who cannot work. It's essential for, uh, for trust and, and uh, a social fair uh, society. Um, so you ask the question, what, what measures should, should we do? And of course, it's, it's a very different uh, um, uh, challenges in, in Norway uh, and in Greece on this uh, issue. But uh, I think we have experienced the same trends. And we are just as aware of uh, protecting our system uh, that we see are challenged as you are, I guess, uh, aware of uh, building a system. Um, so how do we distribute income evenly? Well, there are three main channels, channel, channels, I think. The first is, of course, uh, wage setting. Those who are working, they receive wages, and wage setting is essential uh, for fighting uh, inequality. And we cannot uh, let the free market or the distribution of power decide uh, who should get increase in pay and so forth we must take control over the wage setting. And uh, in Norway and in Nordics, uh, the, the, the parties uh, are strong, covering most sectors and are centralized. And I think that uh, if we get the responsibility, we also uh, uh, manage to, uh, to distribute this fairly and gain the trust. So responsibility and trust uh, goes hand in hand. Uh, those who cannot work, they have to receive some kind of income security from the public. So we have to build good welfare systems. And thirdly, I think it's also important that income is not only uh, wages or, or security, but it's also ex uh, expenditures. So it's very important that the uh, essential core public services are stayed in, in the public sector and are free to the uh, to the public so uh, we have to build strong wage setting systems we have to be, build a uh, comprehensive welfare state and we do have to uh, uh, supply basic services freely from the public sector to the population, I think. Okay, thank you very much, Roger, for that. Um, so I'll turn now to um, uh, Ms. Xenakopoulou and Mr. Giros. Also, I'd like to, to put in the mix, if you can, uh, have a question, uh, for example, on the role of, of the nature of the, of the Greek economy, having very small and very, very small businesses, uh, and how does this affect the strategy of dealing with the pandemic, the recovery, uh, and going forward? Um, so uh, I, I think we, 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 we heard the message from uh, an experts from Norway and their social model they have built there, but of course they also have, uh, I should add that as well, to just to be the devil's advocate, if you like, in a sense, uh, very, very competitive and productive businesses as well. Um, so um, how do we, can we achieve in Greece this, this kind of uh, 
miracle of the Nordic countries, uh, this the combination of social trust and solidarity with very productive and competitive business. Um, again, I will start with uh, Ms. Ksenia Kopoulou. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that I'm very happy to follow uh, the remarks of Mr. Bjornsson. Uh, he spoke uh, on behalf of the trade unions and his experience in Norway. It's true that uh, the economic and social situation uh, in Greece and in the south of Europe is quite different from Norway and the Nordic countries. But uh, the principles are common, are common European uh, democratic and social principles. And this is the, the recipe to go forward, especially facing uh, the so dramatic results of this pandemic crisis and on economic and social field. Uh, it's important what uh, Mr. Bjornsson has said, that we need to protect social markets from low wages, from social dumping, and he elaborated on how trust uh, can be consolidated. In order to consolidate trust, because Mr. Katsik has, uh, has uh, a point when he said that in Greece we have a highly polarized political and social scene. But the question is, how do we uh, build trust? We build trust through collective bargaining. When in Greece at this stage we have 10, 14 percent coverage of collective bargaining, when uh, the average in Europe is uh, nearly 60 to 70 percent, and I'm sure in the Nordic countries even more. We, we don't have uh, the necessary social value in Greece, and uh, I'm sorry to refer again to this um, labor law, which uh, of course goes to the other way, not the way of uh, strengthening the trade unions and collecting bargaining. Uh, so you cannot ask for trust and for social dialogue when you do not have the democratic and social means to develop this trust and this collective responsibility. Uh, secondly, when we uh, say about best practices, Mr. Aguirre said about best practices in other European countries. Uh, in other European countries, of course, we have, uh, in order to refer again to this point, uh, very different average of collective bargaining, of trade unions participation, of council of working people uh, participation, and of course, a different uh, low wage system. Uh, and uh, it's quite important at the period when we are facing uh, all these problems of the crisis that in order to support the SMEs, and because uh, Mr. Katzkis uh, asked me this, I must tell you that the representative of the SMEs, of the YSV and uh, uh, the commerce uh, uh, organizations, were also very skeptical and against this uh, label law, uh, because exactly they said that collective bargaining means fair competition for the small and medium-sized enterprises. And at this stage, this uh, fair competition does not exist when you don't have these collective bargainings when uh, you expand uh, standard work, which is uh, in favor of big enterprises, for example. And also, of course, small and medium-sized enterprises profit from uh, uh, the expenditure of uh, the employees of the working class, which is now have, is going to have uh, problems uh, in order to uh, to, to have the possibility of uh, facing uh, its uh, needs for a family with low, low wages and uh, the results of uh, these uh, policies chosen. Uh, I will end my contribution with uh, the main question that I find that is very important for Mr. Katzkis. How do we uh, change and how do we face the structural problems of our economy? And that is the main issue. I would support that the way to uh, have these uh, necessary changes cannot be uh, by transforming our country in a low cost and uh, without regulation labor market. That is not the way ahead. That is not the way ahead that um, 
is uh, prevailing at this stage um, at European level and also uh, at the United States level. With the policies that President Biden has um, put forward. So I would say that because of this transformation, should be in a fairly way uh, distributed and the benefits also, not again as all these ten years uh, uh, in the detriment of salaries and the working people. So the way ahead is that we need to make changes, but they need to be made in a democratic and social way and through collecting bargaining and through sharing also the costs and the benefits in order to move ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, comments. Mr. Aguru. Thank you, Dimitri. And let me assure you, uh, I'm um, about to make a joke now. I don't take this very seriously that <laughs> uh, you can be assured that this is not a dialogue of death. I uh, hear all colleagues very carefully. And of course, the fact that I don't always agree with 100% uh, with somebody doesn't mean that I don't listen very carefully to what they say. Now, uh, regarding the question of trust, absolutely important, no question about it. It is extremely important for many reasons. Me, as an economist, I can tell you that trust is uh, a driving force of economic life. Uh, take, for example, uh, how firms grow. They pull uh, resources together. So different people are getting together, they put their capital together, and then they build something stronger and more dynamic. If there is no trust between them, such kind of coordination cannot happen. So I think we are all in agreement. The, uh, the role of trust in economic and social life is important, and trust is, of course, a prerequisite for solidarity. How do you obtain them? Well, I think that some common sense uh, arguments are as follows. Uh, you are trusted as... Uh, political leadership if you are open and transparent and honest. So that is a prerequisite. A meritocracy is very important. It is important especially for young people and in the case of Greece uh, this is the result of various kinds of surveys among uh, young Greeks who went abroad. The number one uh, motivation for going abroad is the lack of meritocracy particularly in professional life. So that is something uh, important as well. And also you gain trust if you deliver. And here, uh, Roger will allow me to disagree a little bit. I think that you can gain trust during crisis periods. Take, for example, uh, the case of Greece during the pandemic. During the pandemic, Greece is widely regarded internationally to have coped very well, very well. Take, for example, the vaccination program. Uh, Norway is a golden standard when it comes to social services, but as we speak today, Greece has vaccinated more people than Norway per 100% uh, percent of population. Uh, now, if during crisis periods you respond well, you manage things well, uh, like the vaccination program I told you, or the digitalization revolution that has happened in Greece over the last 20 uh, or the last 18 months, uh, then this changes perceptions or starts changing perceptions. And uh, I think that the present administration during the crisis has built it trust with the Greek people, and this is a great legacy for the way forward. Uh, Dimitris, you ask what kind of reforms do we need? Uh, my technocratic answer to this question is that we need reforms that are pragmatic and evidence-based. Basically, you need reforms that are informed by international and local experience. You, you, you do the things that worked, and you don't, think the, you don't do the things that did not work. So uh, I cannot resist the temptation to say once again that if something for 40 years is not working, then perhaps it's time to change it. And how do you change it? By doing things that have worked. And uh, again, we may disagree here with uh, Mrs. Xenagagopoulou. I would say that the proof of the pudding is in the eating. We will see if it works or not. And of course, if it doesn't, we should try to make it work again. Uh, now, last, uh, last uh, remark. I think that, again, we are all in agreement that when it comes to people that, for one way or another, cannot sustain themselves, cannot help themselves, cannot work, definitely there should be a, a credible, effective working safety net. No question about that. I agree with Roger. I think that we, all, uh, we are all in agreement. Again, I think that when it comes to core social services, they must be available, free, to all citizens. No question about that. 
Uh, the question is, how do we achieve this? And the answer is that in order to redistribute income, you must have it at the first place. And this is where I am a little bit skeptical when it comes to putting wage setting 100% centralized, because then, as economists, uh, we know the role of incentives. So you need to find the right balance. And I think that what we should do is take a middle of the road approach and uh, do things that are uh, consensual and uh, effective. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Just to clarify, uh, regarding the dialogue of the deaf, uh, of course, I did not mean the, uh, our discussion here, but more generally the, the political debate in the country. Um, uh, I, I think we have run over our time. I think this uh, discussion should be viewed as an opening of a broader discussion. I think we have touched on many interesting and very crucial things and challenges for the future. We cannot, of course, exhaust them here. Um, and we have run uh, out of time. I would like to thank very much uh, uh, all the participants. Perhaps we're going to have a, another opportunity to discuss these things further when the final report of our project comes out in, in autumn uh, with uh, a lot of uh, specific empirical findings, including a survey. Um, for until then, I would like to again thank everybody for I think a very fruitful uh, and interesting discussion, um, uh, and thank everybody who watched the, uh, the the event and participated with their comments. Um, I'd like to thank uh, uh, um, uh, the Norwegian Embassy and uh, Stan uh, Gendem for participating, Ms. Kisnogiana Kopulu, our MP, Mr. Argiru. Roger Bonstad, um, Christine Alsos, and Daphne Nicolichas. Thank you all, uh, and have a good evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.